Good evening, everyone, and thank you all for joining us. Um, I want to welcome you to this wonderful event hosted by CVUSD's Breakthrough Student Assistant Program and the Conejo Schools Foundation with presentations from the Los Robles Regional Medical Center, the Thousand Oaks Police Dar Department, and Ventura County Behavioral Health. Um, my name is Addie Craig, and I'm CVUSD student board member and chairperson of the Student District Advisory Committee. Um, so for those who don't know what the Student District Advisory Committee is, you might have heard it's called SDAC. Um, we're a group of student representatives from all five Conejo Valley High School school sites that work to advocate the student voice and provide input on district matters. Um, we gather and provide feedback on a variety of topics, including educational equity, mental health, um, reopening and redesigning the schools, um, and also additional projects, including like updating the dress code and cell phone policy. So I just want to do a shout out. So for any students and parents who are in the audience tonight, if you ever have any concerns or comments regarding any of the topics I just mentioned or anything that's related to school in general, um, please feel free feel free to reach out to me or any of our SDAC representatives. Again, we have six at each school site, so um, you can find a list of our student members as well as a Google form where you can submit concerns on our website, which is accessible via the um, CVUSD website as well. Um, and just SDAC is a resource for all of our students and a platform to connect us to the education system, so please do not hesitate to reach out to me or any of the SDAC members. Um, so, after just a blur about SDAC, um, getting on to tonight's presentation, we all know it's the behavioral health workshop about marijuana. Um, and from a student perspective, there are a lot of misconceptions about this topic where, um, you know, when we're younger, we're often told just to say no to drugs or frightened with statistics about drug use. And this lack of explanation results with students learning about marijuana from the internet and from peers, which as we know, can lead to a lot of false assumptions especially during the lockdown where a lot of mental health issues have become a challenge for many. Substance abuse has been on the rise and spreading awareness about the real effects of marijuana and healthy habits, especially amongst students is imperative now so more than ever. Um, and so in tonight's workshop presented by our community partners, we're gonna go in depth about the actual effects in, of marijuana and eliminate some stigmas and falsities. Our series of guest speakers tonight include David Tovar, a substance use prevention expert, Dr. Taki, a medical director of neurosciences at Los Robles Regional Medical Center, Senior Deputy Rob Brady and Student Resource Officer Amber Voorhees from the Thousand Oaks Police Department, and Erica Fernandez, the Community Service Coordinator at Ventura County Behavioral Health. Um, in addition, we're going to be answering a series of pre-submitted questions at the end of the workshop, but as we go through these presentations, if you ever have any questions, um, please feel free to enter them in the Q&A box down at the bar below, and um, Brenda Rachels, which is one of the Breakthrough Counselors, will be answering them throughout the workshop. So again, I want to thank you all for attending, and I'm going to hand it off to David Tavar so we can go ahead and get started. Thank you so much, Addy. I'm so happy to be here uh, tonight with each and every one of you. Again, my name is David Tovar. I wanna thank Conejo Valley Unified School District, the Breakthrough Student Assistance Program, uh, all of our wonderful panelists, and to each of you for showing up. Uh, I know that this past year has been a wild one for myself. Uh, and actually it was a week ago last year that I went home and I haven't been back to work since. So this year, uh, is a year of coping. It's a year of, um, it's been a year of understanding and it's been a year of change. Uh, and that's much like, you know, the, the subject we're talking about tonight, uh, cannabis or marijuana or in general substance use and mental health. Uh, so one, one thing I want to make sure I do is slow down for our interpreter. So if I don't make it through all of my slides, I'm really sorry, uh, but I am trying to give her the benefit to, to be able to translate for everyone. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so first, I really want to touch on prevention and, and what prevention is, because there's a lot of misconceptions out there. Prevention is not treatment. Prevention is not recovery. Prevention is its own separate and unique field that really looks at a holistic approach and tries to tackle diff this difficult subject of, of not just how to prevent cannabis use or substance use or addiction, but also how do we prevent disease? How do we prevent illness and other social issues within our community? Next slide, please. So, you know, I'm gonna talk a little bit about environmental prevention. And this is a subject that, that I've worked in with, within a number of years. 
And it, I think it's, it's really important as a basis for this conversation moving forward uh, to recognize that the individuals, right, they don't become substance involved and addicted solely based on genetic factors or predisposition. But yet it's our community that affects the influence that, that, that we have in our lives with these, with these substance use. So whether it's a community's rules to allow a number of liquor stores or dispensaries or other outlets like bars, clubs, and restaurants uh, in condensed areas, uh, whether it's mass media and messaging and, and advertisements you get on social media, or uh, you know, whether it's the legal aspects of, of if it's allowed within a state or a country or within our region. Uh, so all of these little factors play into uh, this, uh, you know, how an individual or how a community uses substances. Next slide, please. And so what I'm trying to do and what we're trying to do here today is, is really take a public health approach. Right to promote physical and social health and, and, and cultural movement forward to decrease these problems within our community. And, and we do that through, through things like this, through strategies of engaging parents to talk about the best practices for promoting well-being, right? The best practices for communities on how to reduce these problems associated with substances. And today it's cannabis, tomorrow it could be alcohol, the next day it could be another thing. Next slide, please. Uh, and so we do this by uh, addressing a number of issues, right? Whether it's access and, and availability, social norms and how we talk about substances and public safety. And luckily we have representatives here today from each of these areas uh, to engage with each and every one of you on these topics. Next slide, please. So really what I want you to start thinking about when we think about prevention is the four Ps of prevention, which I stole from the four Ps of marketing right? That's the price, the placement, the promotion, and the product. And if we can affect these four areas and, and how kids or how our youth interact with these, then we can really make a dent and we can make a change within our community to reduce the amount of abuse and harm and misuse from these substances. Next slide, please. So what is cannabis? And, and I knew I already threw a wrench in, in this presentation, right? Because this is what you need to know about marijuana. And I'm talking about cannabis. Uh, but the reason why I say cannabis rather than marijuana or reefer as this mentions here or, uh, or another term or name is because this is the legal name here in California. Uh, it is cannabis. Uh, and that's the crazy part about this substance is there are so many different names. There are so many different ideas. And if you move from one community to the next, that each one will have a different way of identifying it and engaging and talking about this substance. And, you know, it's more than just a plant. Uh, it, it's a whole cultural phenomenon. It is a substance used uh, for medicinal and adult use, right? It's abused. We have to provide prevention and treatment services for it. So, when I talk about cannabis and when we talk about cannabis here, know that we're talking about something that's more than just a plant. It's more than just a substance. It, it's, a, it's a whole identity. Next slide. All right, but if we're gonna talk about the plant first, then let's understand what it actually is, right? Because it is a plant nonetheless, and it's a plant that can aid, uh, contains something called cannabinoids which are these unique compounds which interact with receptors in the brain, which I'm sure that Dr. Taki, who's next, knows a whole lot more than I do about it. But really, what we need to know about these is that these cannabinoids, they affect certain areas of our brain, and specifically, they affect the areas that affect mood and memory and sleep and appetite, pain, and immune function. Next slide, please. And there's 500 different chemicals uh, within the cannabis plant. But generally, we just talk about two, right? We talk about delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol, which is a really big word for THC, uh, the substance that, that primarily is associated with the psychoactive effects, right? The high and the euphoric effects. And then there's CBD, which um, is another chemical found in it. And unlike THC, right, it's non-psychoactive, it has very little or no potential for abuse. Uh, and there's, you know, some research on, on possible medicinal capabilities of it. 
And so again, how we talk about these substances really matters because there's so many different substances within this plant. Next slide, please. All right, and, and how we speak of it, like I said, is important. And so we need to be able to, to diverge and talk about these things and what's good and what's bad and how do, you know, how do we as adults engage with these substances, but also how do we deter our youth, right, from using substances and using cannabis. Uh, next slide, please. All right. And over time, what we've seen, uh, you know, from 1995 to 2014 is this exponential growth in the strength of THC within cannabis, uh, moving, you know, something like three, four fold. Uh, and this is from this study specifically looked at cannabis that was illicitly grown. And so we know that cannabis that's sold within dispensaries is much more potent than this. But I know the officer will touch on this, but we're looking at concentrates, which is uh, cannabis that has been stripped of its THC, uh, upwards of 98, 95% uh, pure. And that we know that in these, in this study, the CBD content has actually gone down. Uh, and, and it affects the outcomes and affects the results and affects the development of the teen brain. Next slide, please. All right, and I'll give you a little history because it's really important to know the history, but in, and even past this, there was the Marijuana Tax, in tax and Stamp Act. In 1970s, there was the CSA, or the Controlled Substances Act, which banned and right and put cannabis into the Schedule One drug, meaning that there is no acceptable medical use. And there's a high potential for abuse and physical or psychological dependence. So it outright banned cannabis. But in 1996, California, we passed Proposition 215. We're the first state in the entire United States to pass a medical marijuana or medical cannabis um, policy or proposition. Uh, and it really did a number of things. Next slide, please. And within Prop 215, it outlined a whole number of areas at which someone could be recommended. Remember, it's not prescribed by a physician. It is recommended because prescriptions are guided by the FDA. Uh, and since it's a Schedule One drug, it can not be um, regulated by the FDA. Uh, but Prop 215 uh, deemed that these uh, ailments, right, that marijuana was able to, to treat them. But at the very bottom, it said, or any other illness at which marijuana provides relief. And oh man, that opened a can of worms. Why? Because if a doctor said you needed it, guess what? It provided relief for it, and therefore you could get a recommendation. And so this enabled a proliferation of, of dispensaries and of doctor shops that specialized in this sort of stuff and opened up social access to many of our, our young people and individuals. Next slide, please. Uh, and I'm gonna slide through these actually really quickly because I see I'm running short on time. So next slide and next slide, I think next slide. All right, so really what I want to talk about is, is social access, because this is how most teens get cannabis, get alcohol, or other so substances of abuse, right? In other words, they get them through parties. They get it through siblings or, or other trusted friends, or even their parents or other adults. And so parties and, and, and home settings, right, they're frequent sources of, of, of these substances. Uh, and so that's where people oftentimes used for the first time, unknowing of the potential, uh, potential for abuse, the potential for addiction, and the potential for impairment. And I know the, the officer can touch on social host ordinances that we have here in Thousand Oaks uh, and throughout many other communities here in Ventura County uh, about the penalties that we levied on parents for hosting underage parties where, where kids consume alcohol or other substances. Uh, but also we need to talk about the high risk activities that could happen at these, right? Whether it's driving to or from and the car crashes and, and DUIs that occur from that, sexual assaults, fights, property destruction, and other high risk behaviors that, uh, that come as a result of this social access. Next slide, please. All right, but then we also have nowadays, since the legalization of cannabis is the social influence is the influencers online, whether it's through social media, uh, through traditional media, 
or through just a friend group and how we now glamorize the use of these substances uh, and you know people idolize it and and we really see some malicious practices around uh, engaging with youth. I, I once saw an ad for vaping uh, that advertised you know wonderful flavors uh, while at the same time saying, hey, it also reduces your appetite and it's zero calories. So not only are you gonna smoke strawberries, which also may or may not have some THC in it, but it has zero calories and it's gonna help you it's gonna help you lose weight. Right. So we need to look at the practices of, of these companies and how do we talk to our children about this to get them above the influence. Next slide, please. Because we know that kids are bombarded constantly by influencers, by um, by by maybe media titans and, and billionaires like this guy, Elon Musk, who, who owns Tesla, right? And so they look up to these individuals. They trust them. They see that, you know, him on, on Joe Rogan's show smoking and they think, man, I want to be like that guy. He's a billionaire. He's successful. If he can do it, I can do it. There's going to be no fallout for me when in reality, you know, the younger someone starts, the more likely they are to have a substance use disorder, the more likely there's risk for abuse and dependence. Next slide, please. So, you know, we need to understand addiction because the younger someone starts, the younger someone engages in these high risk activities, that they are more likely to fall victim to these. So, you know, we need to recognize what addiction is and that's, you know, the continuing use uh, even though there's persistent harm, uh, whether it's interpersonal or within their work or school relationships, that they engage continuously in, in, in this, knowing that there's high-risk activities, uh, and despite, you know, persistent problems within their life. So, you know, I'm so happy that each and every one of you are here today uh, to, to, to start this conversation, uh, because it is a continuing conversation. Uh, that doesn't just happen once you go to one presentation and it's over. Uh, it's not the talk, right? You need to continue having the talk uh, throughout, you know, the school year and beyond. Next slide, please. So thank you so much for having me here today. I know I'm going to stick around for the Q&A session. Uh, I finished right on time. I'm so proud of myself. Uh, but thank you so much. And, and I'm looking forward to our other presenters as well. everyone. Uh, good evening. Uh, I'm Asha Saki. Uh, I'm one of the neurologists who work at the Los Angeles Hospital. I'm also a medical director for neurosciences here. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, thanks for everyone who has joined uh, to listen. Uh, I will be concentrating more on the use of cannabis in adolescent population and the effect of that um, into their development. But let's talk about a little bit of statistics. Uh, how are we doing? And according to the 2019 uh, Research Center analysis, about two thirds of the Americans believe that marijuana should be legalized. Uh, legalization, as we know, started in 70s as of 2019. About 32% of the US adults continue to oppose the legalization. Uh, in California, 2016, uh, the legislation was passed for above 21 years of age to legalize marijuana use. With the rise in the public and the legislative approval, uh, the adolescents' access to substance remains concerning, despite the various safeguards that are presently in place. Next. The long-term study of the American adolescents, college students, uh, and adult high graduate, uh, which is called Monitoring the Future in 2015, and conducted a survey of around uh, 45,000 individuals regarding the use of the substance. Uh, the survey has been conducted since 1975 annually. According to 2015, uh, the numbers were very concerning. About 80% of the 12th graders reported that they could get marijuana fairly easily or very, very easily if they wanted. About 66% of the 10th grader had the same response and 37% of the 8th graders. 
uh, think that they can get one very easily if they want. The trends in uh, marijuana use among adolescents, as you can see the chart, alcohol, marijuana, tobacco uh, are the substances which have been mostly used by adolescents. Uh, marijuana specifically has a larger volume than any other substance. Roughly about 50% of the high school students have reported uh, using marijuana. And the frequency varied if you look at the lifetime versus monthly, there's at least a 25% uh, that use it monthly, which is a very substantial number. Next. According to the partner attitude tracking study, another study that was done in adolescents, four in 10, which is 41% of the studied population reported having used marijuana before the age of 15. There's also an evidence to suggest that those who initiate marijuana use at a younger age are more likely to use substance more frequently uh, than those who begin using at an older age. Now we talk about the potential risk and the effect of uh, THC and cannabinoids. So there are potential risks associated with the uh, early adolescent use of marijuana. However, today we will focus on the marijuana impact on the brain structure and the function. It's worth mentioning that the studies regarding marijuana physiological impact show conflicting evidence. Uh, therefore, more research is needed and we'll talk more about that at the end. Uh, some research suggests that the exposure to TSC in developing brains may delay the maturations of the prefrontal cortex. And we'll talk more about the prefrontal cortex in this few slides. So this is the picture of the brain. Um, as you can see, the purple and the red part is the front. Uh, the orange part, the primary visual cortex is at the back and everything else is between. Uh, the prefrontal cortex, as you can see, occupies a major portion of the brain, and it's um, associated with goal-oriented patterns of behavior, sustained attention, motor attention, short-term memory, inhibitory control of inference, information processing, working memory, uh, stimulus detection, planning, flexibility, delayed learning, problem solving. It also participates in the memory encoding and retrieval. Uh, it also participates in the intelligence of both verbal expression, uh, memory, abstraction, ability to formulate behavioral patterns and pursue them, uh, language, visual search, and the gaze control, meaning the control of the eye movement. Marijuana used by adolescents has been associated with the white matter development and impulsivity. We'll talk a little bit more about the white matter development in the next few slides. Uh, the relationship between the adolescent's cannabis use and response inhibition have been found to be robust and long-lasting. Response inhibition is a ability to suppress an inappropriate behavior uh, that gets lost if you use marijuana at the younger age. Heavy marijuana use in adolescents often show disadvantages in neurocognitive performance. Again, that's memory, remembering stuff in school, um, macrostructural and microstructural brain damage and alteration in the brain functioning. The author of these specific study make it that the changes occur because of use of marijuana or people who have these changes are more prone to use marijuana. And that's one of the limitations of the medical literature that we have available for now. Other possible risk includes academic behavior and performances decline, uh, social exchanges and experiences, and perhaps the occupational functioning in adulthood. This is how the developing brain looks like. So if you look at the far extreme left picture, age five, mostly everything is green, which means that's in development. And as it gets more and more blue, that means that it's getting more and more mature. So if you look at the front part of the brain, it's the last one to mature at, at about age 20 uh, that gets blue. So the adolescents continue to uh, mature and develop well into an individual mid to late 20s. Specifically, these brain changes include myelination and synaptic pruning, which means how you mature the connections between the brain. The remodeling process are associated with neural processing and are believed to be necessary for ideal neurocognitive performance, which means that once you develop these connections between the different part of the brain so that they can talk to each other, that's how you develop your ability for cognition and memory and performance. During this time, the cannabinoid receptors are dispersed throughout the hippocampus and the prefrontal cortex. Hippocampus is the deeper part of the brain. Prefrontal cortex is on the front as we talked. 
these receptors are thought to play a role in genetic expression of neural development. Uh, so these receptors produce certain uh, signals that the brain learn how to adopt to develop memory and cognition. Uh, changes to the endocannabinoid system, which we'll talk a little bit in more detail, may lead to a poor cognitive and emotional outcomes in adulthood. The endocannabinoid system is active in the body, even if the individual does not use marijuana, it's an endogenous product. Next. This is a very complex picture of uh, endocannabinoid system, and we don't have to go into the details of all of this. All it shows that pretty much every uh, part of the body has these receptors, and every part of the body is impacted uh, in uh, the endocannabinoid system. Next. The ECS is a neuromodulator located all over the human body that performs vital function in the central nervous system, the synaptic plasticity, and response to endogenous and environmental insults. Synaptic plasticity means the development of the brain as a response to an external stimuli. So we all have the ability to develop more and more functionality in the brain as we get older and the external factors play a role, but the endocannabinoid system regulate how that will uh, change the development of the brain. The system is made up of physiological mechanisms that act in response to THC. ECS is further vital for cognition, neurodevelopment, stress response, and emotional control. Among the 60 or the cannabinoids present in marijuana, only THC is the psychoactive uh, part of it. The repeated and prolonged use of marijuana can inhibit the proper and functional cellular activity in this whole system. Again, this is a very complex picture of the endocannabinoid system, but all you can understand from this is that there are endogenous receptors. So in any um, brain cell, which there's a synapse, the connection between the two brain cells, which is called a synapse, has these receptors or cannabinoids. And normally your body is regulating and producing and communicating to these connections, through these connections to the other parts of the brain using the cannabinoid signal. And once you have an external cannabinoid or TSC, they are fighting for those receptors that are supposed to produce in endogenously. So there's a competition now between the external TSC trying to regulate these cells as opposed to the endogenous system. Within the ECS are cannabinoid receptors, the endocannabinoid and enzymes responsible for synthesis and degradation of the endocannabinoid. CBI are the amplest cannabinoid receptors located all over the brain, but again, mostly in the prefrontal cortex. Other receptors that are engaged by cannabinoids include CB2 cannabinoid receptor located in the glial cells, which are the deep gray uh, matter cells in the brain, Brain stem, which is the main part of the brain that controls awakefulness, uh, the transient receptor potential channels, and the periocrinal proliferated active receptors, and all those are involved in the development of the brain. Anywhere a CBI receptor may exist, TSC can have it effect. So again, you can visualize that how the external TSC will be competing with our own endogenous cannabinoid in all these different areas of the brain and the nervous system. Next. The distribution of the CB1 cannabinoid 1 receptors in the brain, uh, again, are all over. They're mostly located in the prefrontal cortex, but it's also in the hypothalamus, the caudate the nucleus, the putamen, globus pallidus, amygdala, and all these have their own important functions, including memory and personality development and coordination. Ultimately, what the endocannabinoid system does is an example of a retrograde neurotransmission. Um, it's a very big medical terminology, but what, what it means is the exon or the cell that is located next to the cell, if this is one cell and the cell is located here, this cell is communicating in this direction to the previous cell and telling that cell to release hormones to modify. So that's, that's what's called the neuroplasticity or the development of the brain, that the cells communicate to each other and give each other signal to modify things from memory, from personality, 
and those can be affected by the external cannabinoid during the developmental process. This picture is going to make it more simple. If you see the purple is the cannabinoid receptor and the cell above, the cell below has this green neurotransmitter thing that can release cannabinoid. When it's released, the thing thing, it goes and goes to the receptor on the cell above it. And that's how it modulates and tell that cell to release different hormones and different neurotransmitters to form different pathways. And if we have an external cannabinoid, it, it's competing or fighting with this pink cannabinoid, which is released by the body, trying to develop the systems to communicate with each other. The reward circuit. The review of the frequent cannabis users have demonstrated that the cognitive function decline with the greater deficits in individuals who begin the use in adolescence. The author of this meta-analysis did note that the increasing rate of absence were associated with a smaller impact, which means that if you take away marijuana from these users, uh, then the memory does not come back right away. They also discuss the subtle but possibly unfavorable cognitive deficits related to attention, learning, and memory. Teens between the age of 3 and 13, sorry, not 30, 3 to 13 were followed, and it was determined that the cumulative marijuana use over eight years was related to poor performance on measure of attentional functioning. A cross-section study of marijuana users between 16 to 18 found that this demographic demonstrated slower processing speed poor verbal learning and memory and sequential ability. In order to understand changes in the brain associated with the absence, Jacob and Taper uh, did a study, monitored marijuana users 15 to 19 over a three week of afternoon. At baseline, they captured differences in the attention, learning, memory, and after three weeks of afternoon's learning and memory performance reached similar levels of performance as the control group. However, the attention deficits persisted even after stopping marijuana use for three weeks. The young adults between the age of 20 and 24, cannabis users were found to experience memory deficits. However, it was also discovered that the prolonged abstinence over eight years can improve the performance. So if you just Stop it for three weeks, it didn't have any significant effect on their attention deficits. But if they stop it for eight years in the long term, they can regain the memory deficits that they have. And there, another study completed by Takagi and colleagues of those cannabis use between 13 and 24 years of age. Uh, the study found that this population of individuals performed worse on measures of immediate and delayed verbal memory compared to community control. Same team of investigators later observed no difference in the measure of executive functioning between the cannabis users and the community control. I mean, if you can, uh, if you have a group of uh, same age group and you measure these findings between the two who are using cannabis or not, they did not find the changes in the executive functioning, but there were significant uh, changes in the measures of immediate and delayed memory. Other studies found differences in young adults cannabis users in the control group regarding immediate and delayed recall. However, in this group, no differences were observed on measures of impulsivity. The author of this study found that the cannabis users performed worse on a decision-making task. Another study observed 181 adolescents and found cannabis users to perform worse on learning and recall poor performance correlated to the severity, frequency, and the age of initiation. Lastly, the largest scale longitudinal study out of New Zealand in studying about more than 1,000 individuals from birth to age 38 demonstrated a decline in intelligent coefficient IQ by an average six to eight point, specifically executive functioning and processing speed. It's almost like a how fast the computer can process. When you're comparing the speed of processing in different individuals, the authors notably suggest that cannabis users with a weekly use before the age of 18 demonstrated greater decline in their cognitive performance. Um, this is again a busy chart of very 
multiple studies done in different age groups. You can look at it from 13 all the way up to 20. And the methods were analysis of these domains or different a mechanism to evaluate the brain tissue, not just by uh, functionality, but also by the structure of the brain. The different methods of analysis include diffusion tensor imaging, the MRIs that actually shows how the cannabis use is affecting the brain tissue, not just the effect on cognition and the effect on impulsivity, but actually looking at the brain itself. And most of these studies, as you can see on the timely result, decreased attention, memory performance, white matter integrity, increased the cortical thickness, which we'll talk a little bit more in a few slides, next few slides, decreased the attention and the memory performance, um, decreased the psychomotor speed, decreased the cortical thinning, uh, decreased cognitive inhibition and the memory performance, uh, decreased cortical surface reduction, and the left lateral orbital frontal cortex. This is how the brain is structured, uh, looking at it in a cross section, like if you cut the brain like this. The top part of the brain uh, is called the gray matter, the inside part is called the white matter. And the gray matter makes up of roughly about 40% of the brain, contains most of the brain neuron cell bodies, which means the actual cell, uh, develop entirely in individual in the 20s, uh, conduct, process, and send information to various parts of the body, the gray matter includes region of the brain involved with muscle control and sensation. The white matter of the brain makes about 60%, consists mainly of myelinated axons. So these are the channels or the extensions of the cells that go and communicate with the other cells. They form connection between cells and white matter, uh, developed throughout an individual 20s and 60s in the middle age, and interpret sensory information from various parts of the body. So we concentrate on the gray matter macrostructure, which is mostly affected by marijuana. In the growing children, gray matter structure has been reported to demonstrate a dynamic changes during adolescence. A part of this maturation is the relatively high density of CBI receptor throughout the brain. The studies have suggested some modification in the gray matter macrostructure, but the evidence is inconsistent overall. For example, in the 2019 publication, was able to demonstrate extensive region of the gray gray matter in participants who reported low levels of cannabis use matched those in the control group. The authors identified significantly greater gray matter volume in adolescents who reported only one or two instances of cannabis use relative to the control in the large medial temporal clusters, including the amygdala, the hippocampus, the striatum, the prefrontal cortex. Also, the greater gray matter volume was noted in the lingual gyri, posterior stimulate, and cerebellum. So all, all what it means is the uh, users of cannabis have a different growth in the gray matter compared to the uh, people who are not using the marijuana. Pre-existing structural abnormalities may also play a role in behavioral differences that lead to cannabis use. And that's one of the limiting factors for all, almost all of the studies so far. As you look at the changes in the brain, but we don't know if the changes lead to more use of marijuana versus there's the effect from the marijuana. Okay. Continuing on the gray matter and marijuana, the researchers used a whole brain image analysis called the WOX based morphometry to compare the gray matter volume in 46 individuals, uh, 14 years adolescents, who reported having used cannabis on just one or two occasions with the MASH controls who had never used THC. After controlling for the variables, the author indicated that even a very low use among 14 years old causes notable change in the gray matter, uh, gray matter volume. It, it, they did not specify what the increased matter volume means. However, the authors did specify that the enlargement of the gray matter does contradict normal adolescence development. So normally, you don't expect the gray matter volume to reach that level, which you would use even with a low uh, frequency use of marijuana. In the medical literature, white matter has been shown to increase linearly throughout the early development. White matter is thought to be important for cortical connectivity in developing the brain. Again, the white matter is responsible for communication between different parts of the brain. The brain becomes increasingly myelinated and the fiber bundles mature from birth to adolescence. 
to measure the integrity of the white matter at the microstructure level. We use an imaging technique that's called diffusion tensor imaging. Fractional anisotropy is a scalar value between zero and one that describes the degree of anisotropy of a diffusion process. So the lower the value, it means the lower the connection uh, are in the brain. According to one study, the chronic and the frequent nirvana use has demonstrated a significant reduction in the fractional anisotropy. But again, it means that there's a less development of a white matter, uh, less connection formation between the different parts of the brain. In conjunction to the above, high level of pulsivity were also reported in those individuals. Furthermore, early adolescence onset of marijuana use was a factor associated with lower levels of fractional anisotropy. The study composed of 18 healthy individuals and 25 frequent marijuana smokers. In order to quantify impulsivity, the, there's a scale system that was used. All participants participated in the BIS in order to self-report self impulsivity. The scale included the attention, motor, and non-planning uh, non domains. At the moment, moving forward, at the moment, uh, the medical literature available lacks consistency and consensus when it comes to the specific effect of cannabis on adolescents' cognitive function, brain morphology, and the socioeconomic consequence of the prolonged substance use. The lack of consistency does not negate the findings. I think it is very clear from all the studies that there is an impact of cannabinoids on the development of the brain. And until we know that, we should be very cautious. What this means is the longitudinal and the concrete studies must be done to provide sufficient information about adolescents' public health. There are many questions that remain to be answered. How does the alcohol impact the adolescent's brain if it is used in combination with cannabis? Are there pre-existing genetic and environmental factors which influence the adolescent brain in such a way that they become more susceptible to seek marijuana? What is the impact of the moderate cannabis use? Um, although there are studies suggesting that even a small use can impact the structure uh, of the brain. What are the short-term and long-term consequences of using marijuana of varying potency? So these are all the questions that we don't have answers yet. Conclusion, the adolescent brain is an inconsistent development. Therefore, it is very vulnerable to the possible effects of marijuana and other substances that can be introduced. Frequent use of cannabis impairs cognitive functioning in various domains. There are greater deficits associated with the adolescent onset of use in comparison to adult onset of use. There appears to be a cognitive improvement for adolescent use of marijuana when the abstinence is active. But again, remember that not all the domains improve. It, sometimes it takes many years for the uh, memory and the attention to come back to normal. While more information regarding marijuana and the developing brain is necessary to advise public health and policy, proceeding with the exceptional caution is imperative within this population. Thank you. Now we'll stay for the Q&A session. Hi guys, uh, real honor to be here. Rob Brady, uh, I've been in the department for 18 years. Steve, you weren't here in the beginning. Uh, worked narcotics, now work for the city of Thousand Oaks and I oversee the school resource officers. Amber is a school resource officer, one of the most tenured ones we have on the agency. So she's got a lot of uh, background with, with juveniles and a lot of the trends that are going on. And I have a, a background, a big background in, in narcotics. So uh, what we're gonna try to do today, uh, go over some of the trends that we're seeing and a lot of the case, we'll try to relate a lot of the, the, uh, the items we'll talk about and try to relate it to a case. Um, and we'll stick around for any questions you guys have. So common street names that uh, we see, um, I'm sure these are pretty common to a lot of you guys as well. Blunt, grass, herb, joint, Mary Jane, weed, and 420. Uh, a lot of times we'll go through cell phones and if there's any, you know, a lot of parents out there, I'm sure that uh, want to go, go through their, their kids' cell phones and see if they're trying to buy marijuana off of um, adults. Uh, so some things that we see and when I work in narcotics, you know, they try to try to hide the name of what they're buying. Hey, give me a, a gram of a, a t-shirt or, or whatever it is. It's, it's usually 
uh, pretty obvious. They try to get pretty uh, tricky with it, but uh, it's usually pretty obvious you're able to go through any of their text messages. Uh, ways it's used, obviously smoked through joints, pipes, bongs. We see a lot of um, uh, uh, vaping or wax pens that Amber will go into a little more detail in a little bit. Uh, edibles, which uh, come in cookies, uh, candy, brownies, waters. Uh, this is usually has a higher content of THC and it takes longer to metabolize. So we've seen a lot of uh, overdoses with this uh, because they initially take the brownie and they don't wait for that time to uh, feel the effects. So they'll take another brownie. And we've had a lot of overdoses that in that way. Um, recently, we had a um, actually a, an elder uh, who was in some pain and his grandson thought it'd be a good idea to give him a, a, some uh, a brownie. And he actually overdosed on it and actually could not move for 12 hours. You, you couldn't, you go to the restroom, couldn't do anything. Um, so that, that was something that we had to respond to. Also, uh, we responded to um, juveniles that have accidentally taken marijuana uh, brownies from their parents. Um, sorry, the vacuum. Is going off right when we start, of course. Um, so we responded to calls like that, and it, and it was simply a parent having a brownie out that they have legally, and um, a, a child just you know took, took it in their lunch. We had one where an, a child took it to school in their lunch, ended up going to the nurse, and this is something that can end up uh, being a, a we call it a debt case, a drug endangered child case. So that's something that we actually have a whole team in narcotics that will investigate and that can end up being a, a serious crime, even if it's an accident. Um, you know, a lot of the search warrants I've done and uh, with ma just marijuana involved, we've uh, arrested a lot of parents just because the marijuana is out and about on a table, even uh, if it's shake, which is the, the ground up portions of marijuana on the table. If a child has access to it, especially a baby, um, then, then that's, that, that person is probably going to end up with a felony. These are some of the items that you'll see um, in, in some of the shops. Uh, I actually took down one uh, case in Moore Park, and it was it literally looked like a convenience store in his garage. He had everything from sodas to waters to candy. You know, every everything you can think of. Uh, had some THC in it, um, and he was trying to do it legally. Um, unfortunately, um, for him, we had to take all of his product, and uh, he actually, it, it wasn't much jail time, but he got a misdemeanor for it, uh, but he lost a lot of money for that. Uh, here's some of the, uh, obviously, just a, a pipe, and some of the ways, that there's so many ways that uh, kids are trying to conceal it from their parents. Uh, the bottom right there, you see that that's actually a pipe, uh, but it, it turns into a, a highlighter. Um, and it looks, the other one is, looks like something that just hooks up to like an audio cord, but it's actually, it's a pipe. Those are both pipes. It was getting really crafty between the wax pens, vape pens, and everything else. It's, they're getting pretty crafty with it. So when, when you kind of went over this a little bit already, but, uh, you know, intoxication, heavy intoxication with a high level of uh, edibles, uh, anxiety, uh, panic attacks, paranoia, dizziness, weakness, slurred speech, uh, poor coordination, uh, high heart rate, you know, breathing problems. We've had overdoses where uh, people have forgotten how to breathe. And, you know, they say, I can't breathe. I, you know, I've forgotten how to breathe. Uh, so there, there's, I mean, we've seen the most overdoses uh, with marijuana through edibles. This is a highly dangerous uh, process. It's done in a lot of homes and a lot of uh, bedrooms. It's a, a BHO lab, which is a, a butane honey oil, and it, it is the, the extraction of, from the leaves of the plant 
uh, just so they don't get rid of anything, uh, any waste. They'll take the leaves, which is usually not used because what's usually used is the butt of the plant. And so they're trying to extract as much THC as they can. They essentially extract all the THC. Uh, the bottom left picture there is uh, butane. If the butane, for whatever reason, is used often to extract this, uh, the tubes, um, I don't want to give too much detail on how it's done, but the tubes are used to throw the uh, butane in there. And what happens, why it's so dangerous, is if you're in a small room, then there's nothing but butane. People don't think of ventilation or doing it outside. Uh, the simple flip of a switch or lighting of a cigarette or something like that, and you, you have yourself a pretty nasty explosion. There's actually one a block from my house where it literally lifted the roof uh, off of the, the house. Um, with a lot of deaths or just um, nasty, nasty burns that um, that uh, you wouldn't want to see. This was actually a case. This is on the on the lines of the wax pans or vapes. This is a, a case we had in Moore Park just recently, where uh, uh, I don't know how he he figured this out, but he stopped an individual in Moore Park, and he had a bunch of wax pens or vape pens, and come to find out that in those vape pens they were. Uh, not marijuana or THC, but they're both meth, heroin, and a lot of what heroin now is uh, because people are getting, but building up a tolerance to it, has fentanyl on it, so these uh, wax pens had not only heroin, but fentanyl and meth in it. So imagine, uh, as Amber was just describing in the bathroom, you know, kids passing a vape pen or a wax pen in the bathroom, and, and um, we know to them that it's a meth or or heroin laced with fentanyl that could be extremely dangerous for for everybody involved. So obviously, some of the common myths is that uh, marijuana is harmless. I think we've kind of debunked that uh, that marijuana is not addictive. Uh, I'll give you an example of someone that I spoke to that uh, gave up in and out for his family and him over marijuana. To me. That's an addiction. If you're going to give up in and out over marijuana, which is he was spending twenty dollars a day uh, for marijuana, um, that's that's a serious addiction because I love in and out, and I think most people here do. Uh, marijuana is not harmful to you. I think uh, that's been discussed already. Uh, marijuana cures cancer, obviously. That's that's a myth, and marijuana is not a gateway drug. Uh, I've spoken to hundreds and hundreds of drug users uh, that have, uh, you know, meth and heroin um, pills. Uh, I, I don't think that I have spoke to one person who was addicted to uh, meth or heroin or cocaine that has said they have not started with marijuana. It always starts with that marijuana high. They, you know, you want to move on to the, to the next thing. So um, in my experience, it definitely is a gateway drug to the, the, the drugs that will, you know, absolutely ruin your life. Uh, effects of marijuana. So, like we said before, the the mood swings, the altered perceptions, impaired coordination, the, getting a DUI, um, it impairs your driving, and it impairs the little things that sometimes teenagers don't think that it will impair them, but it does. Uh, the difficulty thinking and problem solving that relates kind of when they're in school trying to or doing their homework at home. Uh, disruptive learning and memory. Red eyes and dry mouth were some of the physical symptoms that parents can look out for. Lack of motivation. I've had a couple times where um, at the high schools, they get caught with a vape pen or a wax pen, they get suspended and then they get kicked off um, the sports teams. So the lack of motivation, um, you, they've worked their whole life to get to work all these or to have all these sports in their background and they want to play in college and now their motivation is not there anymore. Um, it's very sad. And then the paranoia, which uh, yeah, so we, we had a case, uh, a pretty serious case we had in, in Dallas Oaks. And uh, it was someone who had a, a great job. And it was the first time this person had ever smoked marijuana. And that person had, you know, committed harm to uh, uh, a good friend, uh, dog, and then, and then self-harm. It was just out of pure paranoia, and now that person is not does not have the job, 
and is now fighting a very serious case. And it was all, uh, from my understanding, it, it was uh, paranoia. And, and as far as I know, it was all that was all that was on board. Um, circle back to the the DUI. There, uh, we've also had uh, you know fatality uh, DUIs with. Uh, marijuana on board and there might have been something else on board but look if you get a DUI or you're driving your car and you get into a, an accident where it causes harm to somebody or death and um, even if you're not even may, may not feel the effects and you have marijuana in your system it's going to be investigated as as a serious crime instead of just a, a regular traffic collision. that's something to think about um, and obviously the effects on marijuana if you are under the influence uh, you're going to be doing some jail time for that. So we've kind of gone over about uh, how marijuana is is addictive in and out versus uh, marijuana. So uh, a lot of people do become ad addicted to it and then move on to, to you know, the, the bigger, unfortunately, the bigger drug. Um, so they always have the craving and, and you know, the, the withdrawals are not as easy to... Uh, to fight with no medication or things if you have them or the withdrawal. And sometimes what's happening is um, the irritability, the sleeplessness, anxiety, and the craving, they think by the the kids think by using more marijuana that this is gonna help their symptoms when in reality it's just making them worse. For the marijuana crimes, um Obviously, when we're, when it happens at school, it's a different crime. They also get punished by um, the administration at the school. Um, but for mine and the other SROs jobs, we look for um, how they got it, what they have, and the amount that they have. Um, for instance, the possession of marijuana or the concentrated cannabis, which is the wax I was talking about, so like a, a wax pen, um, they have, that there's an infraction. And then to sell or offer to a minor, that's a felony, which um, can land the people three to seven years in prison. Um, for this, I think the reality of um, people selling or giving either wax pens, vape pens, or, or marijuana to other people, I don't think they realize how serious the crime can be. Uh, especially we have the narcotics team who investigates if someone is badly hurt that was given a drug, then they can go after the person that gave it to them or sold it to them. So there's, um, like he was saying, the, the wax pins with the heroin and the meth inside. That's something that they will investigate fully and whoever um, bought or any of that, then um, they'll go after them too. And then the under the influence of marijuana while driving, we talked about that already. So like uh, Brady said, if there is a traffic collision, and someone is hurt and there's marijuana like in the car or on board after the, the blood test, then it's definitely being investigated as that under the influence, the BUI. Oh, that picture got turned sideways, I apologize. Just, um, some environmental impact um, that, you know, I've done a lot of marijuana grows. Uh, the environmental impact they have, you know, these are guys that are actually really working their butts off. They they go up in the middle of nowhere and they grow these marijuana, uh, and and you know, pushed by the the cartels that uh, you know that they're kind of forced to do this and they make hardly any money. They're out there living in horrible conditions, um, and the chemicals they use on our beautiful in our beautiful backyard, I mean, it just kills me. You know, we're not sometimes not allowed to even haul. The marijuana out because it's, it's so dangerous for us to haul it out. Uh, I don't know, Rebecca, I don't know if that video will play there on the left. Does that play? No, it's, uh, I will just say this in, in closing. Um, it's a video of me hanging from about 4 million feet in the air <laughs> and I'm definitely afraid of heights. So if you could, you know, find it in your heart never to use marijuana because that means maybe I'll never have to uh, hang, hang from a helicopter to uh, go and, and, and take this marijuana down. So thank you guys very much. Uh, if you guys have any questions or anything, even uh, after this presentation, uh, any questions about any anything, uh, there's my email. You can email me directly. Thank you guys. Thank you. Hello everyone. So um, 
right before we end, we're going to um, talk about some tips for parents. So my name is Erica uh, Fernandez, and I am from Ventura County Behavioral Health from our um, prevention department. And uh, we are just going to go over some tips for parents on how they can prevent their youth from using marijuana or how they can help their youth um, if they are using marijuana. Um, so next slide. So just the first thing, yeah, next slide, please. <laughs> um, just the first thing, uh, just some signs to know if our kids are, are using marijuana. Um, if they are high on marijuana, whether it's throw a vape pen or just a regular marijuana, um, one way you could tell would be their red irritated eyes or if they come home and they're just like laughing inappropriately, they think everything's funny, they're acting a little weird or different than usual. Um, if they have difficulty, you know, listening to you or paying attention uh, or remembering something that just happened, you know, it could be a possibility that they are under the influence of marijuana at that point. Um, and other things to look out maybe when um, they're coming off of it or if they're been using it for a while would be, you know, changes in their mood and their behavior. Um, maybe they are sad now or more angry or they get frustrated easier. So just, you know, us as parents know how our kids are and know how they usually act when they come from school or when they're done, you know, when they wake up in the morning. So really take can look at uh, those mood changes and their behaviors, how they change, that can really help us. Um, another thing would be if they're sleeping too much or if they're always tired. Um, if you, now with all the vaping flavors and all that stuff, and even um, with all the dispensers and different types of marijuana, just if you have, if you smell strange odors, um, that can be something as well. Um, some cotton candy, apples, cinnamon, anything that you can think of that you're like, well, why does my, you know, son's or daughter's room smell like this? Those could be things that we can look out for. Um, another thing could be changes in their eating habits. Um, sometimes when they are under the influence of marijuana, they get uh, the munchies, which they'll just be eating a lot and craving a lot of things in the moment. But then also take a look at their overall eating habits. Are they eating a lot um, in the past few weeks, in the past few months? Are they not eating at all? Are they skipping meals? And things like that to keep uh, track of. And then the last thing um, to look out for would be the marijuana paraphernalia. So, you know, maybe in their rooms, in their backpacks, just anywhere around the house. Um, that would be something to keep an eye out. Uh, next slide, please. These would be some pictures of what you can see. So in the top corner, you can see um, like the THC and the oils. So um, if they are using the wax pens or the vape pens, then you would be able to see, you know, anything strange that looks like a pen or any unfamiliar technology looking thing because now they're they're making these pens to look so different than you would think. They could look like USB. B drives, they could look like pens, highlighters, markers, um, a charger, just so many different things that um, they're now making them to look out for. So that would be one thing. And then um, the oils or the plant, which that's how it would look, maybe in little baggies or if it's from a dispensary, they would be like in, in cans um, and things like that. And then another thing to look out for as well, um, next slide please, um, would be like the edibles. So strange candy gummies, um, most of the things that they, if they get it off a, a store somewhere, have somebody else get it for them, it'll say it on there on the bag. Um, it could be gummies, it could be cookies, chocolate, brownies, any kind of candy or sweet that you can think of. Um, they sell it now. It can have it on there. If it is bought from a store, it will say on the wrapping, on the baggie, it will have a sign on there that it has marijuana. Um, another thing to look out for, um, and sometimes parents don't 
are like, well, why would I worry about this would be the clear eyes, um, which is at the in the very middle. And that would be because um, a lot of people use them to put it on their eyes when when they are high. So they're not red or um, irritated or anything like that. So that would be something to look out for. And then, um, you know, the, the wrappers for when they do their blends or the pipe, those would be some examples to look out for. Next slide. And then just some additional things that us as parents can be looking for would be their social media. Um, you know, they are our kids. They are probably living under our roof. So maybe taking a look at what's going on in their social media. Who are they following? Um, what are they they're looking at? What are they searching for? Um, in Instagram, Snapchat, uh, YouTube, Facebook, e everything that they use now. Um, What's that other one? TikTok, um, all those social media sites. Our kids are influenced by all the stuff that is posted there. So it's really important that we know what our kids are looking at and um, where they're getting their ideas from. Um, another thing would be online shopping, especially now that we're in this pandemic, we all of us have probably done some online shopping and we order things and they just get to our home and probably our kids are ordering if they're old enough they're probably ordering stuff too and they just get packages delivered to the house and we don't know what those packages might have so it's really important to keep track of what they're buying because if they're buying things online all the only question that they're going to ask them is are you 21 and older or are you 18 and older? And all you have to do is click yes and it'll send that to them. They're not gonna be searching to see if it's real or not. So um, they can be buying stuff online and just getting delivered straight to our home. So it's really important to look at that. Um, you know, check the bank statements, if you guys have credit cards or if you debit card for the kids, whatever it is to try to keep our kids safe. Um, also keep an eye out to um, our kids' friends. Um, what do their friends do? What kind of sports do they do? What kind of um, activities they're into? Or, or what are the trends that they're doing? Maybe around the neighborhood or, or has my child changed to new friends that are friends that I don't know now? That could be something to look out for as well. Um, and then another thing would be declining grades in school. Um, you know, if they're missing school, if they're getting to school late, if they're not logging in now that we're doing school online um, or missing assignments and their grades are falling down, that would be something of concern as well. And then um, the last one would be just the loss of interest in any sports or activities. If, you know, if your kid loved watching sports or even playing sports and now they don't, that's something to really, you know, that would be a red flag. You know, why don't you like sports anymore? Why don't you like doing this? Or why don't you like, you know, going for a walk with, with the family anymore, having dinner together, just any loss of interest that it was something that they really loved before and now they don't, that means they've switched it to something else and we need to figure out what that something else is. So just a few additional things to look out for. Um, next slide, please. And then, you know, once we're, we've looked out, you know, if we know if our kids are using or not using um just some tips to talking with our kids to trying to find find out what's going on with them it's always you know find the right time um it's really important that when we're talking to our kids is a relaxed conversation that's not going to be interrupted um that is just like go with the flow so it's not tense or just weird between you know like the kids and the parents and stuff like that think of something you know like when you're going for a walk or when you guys are driving somewhere cooking together um cleaning up the house or the backyard doing some gardening just things like that where you could start a relaxed conversation um about you know, drugs, alcohol, marijuana, whatever it is. And then when you actually do start the conversation, talk about something that your child can relate. Um, it is really important that you do start young and make talking about these 
these topics like a regular habit and it is also important to know like what to talk about regarding the age so like if it's a middle school or a high school or even an elementary student so like know what your child at that point can relate and start the conversation on that like maybe comment on a story that came out in the media or in the news something whether it's local or not local um something that's in popular culture news or you know if that if an incident happened at school or anything start by asking questions in that or just bringing it up and see what your child what's their view on that story or on that news and um try to frame it as a health issue if it's something like you know oh did you hear what they're saying about the vape pens that contain thc and uh, a lot of kids are getting sick off of that and then pause and see what they say see what they have to say about it if they've heard it and what their thoughts about it it's really important to listen to what they have to say and just be patient uh, maybe if it's the first conversation it's not you know maybe they're not going to share so much because it's our first conversation about this topic and maybe they're they don't feel comfortable or they're embarrassed or it's just the first time so it's really important to um you know, just take it slow and go with the flow and listen to what they have to say. Next slide, please. Um, also, uh, while having this conversation, we should be clear about our expectations. You know, whatever it is in our household that are um, that's going to be the rules or just what do you expect your shot your child to do? That way, they're able to make healthy choices. Um, you know, for example. I expect, you know, I expect you to get good grades and, you know, be able to trust and come in with me if there is an issue or to be able to know that, you know, using marijuana is bad for your health and it could hurt you in the long run. So just setting those expectations clear to what you want your child to do in a situation so they can make those healthy choices. And it's always on on their head. So when it something does happen or they're in a situation, they know those expectations. They know that, you know, if I do this, you know, my mom and my dad expect me to do this and I won't be able to do it if I get high on marijuana. Or um, if I smoke right now and I'm going home, my mom is going to get home and hug me and she's going to smell me that I smell like marijuana. So it's really important to just set those expectations so they can know and and think about and it just doesn't just catch them off guard um try to ask open-ended questions and not like blaming or intrusive or just you know if for example if you know that your child is hanging out with other kids who use um the way to ask ask them won't be like you know I know your friends are using so you're probably using too so like try to you know ask um you know I heard around that there's been kids that this, that have been using marijuana around the neighborhood have you heard of anything or things like that um try to focus on what if questions so like what if they were to offer you this what what would you say or what would you do in that situation um and that would be really important so you can see where your child is at and what they would answer and see if they have resources at that point and you're able to help them if they don't know what they would answer or they don't know what they would do then that's where you would be able to give them some resources some skills some um some things to cope with on how to answer if they were to be offered marijuana or any other drug and then um one of the last thing that is super important is to be informed in order for us to have these conversations with our children we have to really be informed um be able to answer their questions to whatever it is that they have like if they go through a situation at school or at the park in our neighborhood wherever it is that we're able to answer those questions for them and that way they don't go looking for answers 
on Google or on Instagram or on Snapchat where they're most likely are not going to be correctly answered. And, and it's important to have resources if it gets to that point where we need them for our children, whether if it's for more prevention or treatment or coping resources, whatever type of resources they might need at that moment, we should be able to have those available. So it's really important that we keep up with all the new things that are coming out that we're informed on what can affect our children. Um, because we have to remember that parents are the number one, number one reason why kids choose not to use drugs. Uh, if we're able to be, you know, on top of them and listen to them, to their concerns, then most likely or not, they will make the healthy choice. Um, next page, please. Um, some resources that we have that you guys can check out would be for our marijuana fact check, www.marijuanafactcheck.org. There is a lot of information on there for parents and for youth. Um, where you guys can all go check out all about marijuana, how it affects the teen brain, how it affects during pregnancy, um, information on edibles, vaping, and all of it is regarding facts. It's not, you know, um, for marijuana or against, it's just so you know the facts, so you know how it can affect your brain if you start using marijuana at a young age. How could it affect it in the future? And that way everybody is able to make a smart choice about it. There's also our vaping fact check vc.org website where we post things um, about vaping, about secondhand vaping, um, how it affects us, any news on on vaping and how it's it's affecting with the whole lung disease and anything that comes up, the updates we post them on there as well. Um, Next page, please. This is a picture of our marijuana fact website. That's how it looks. Um, you could click on all the sections. It's in English and Spanish, and you're able to see um, as you like the brain development, um, the vaping pens, um, how there's been ER visits because of the edibles being laying around everywhere, um, ADHD and marijuana, school grades. There's a lot of different things on there that you guys can go check up on there. And then um, next slide, please. And then this is really important for parents. Um, we update this regularly. It is our glossary of terms. So we know what our kids are talking about. You know, sometimes, you know, when they get to high school, they might be texting and using different codes. And in order for us to keep, you know, updated with what's going on, what they're doing, um, you can go over all the slang that they use and that way you know what they're talking about. So uh, it's really important that we stay up to date with that as well. And then um, if you, you know anybody that would need help with marijuana that is looking for treatment in Ventura County, we have our Ventura County Access Line that is 24-7. Uh, uh, and you call that number, 1-844-385-9200. And they'll be able to um, do an assessment, um, see what's going on, and then decide what type of treatment or resources would be most important um, or most useful in that treatment. So. Um, you guys can help give a call there to get some for some resources and information on um, treatment for marijuana. And next slide. And that's it. This concludes our presentation on marijuana, what you need to know. Um, we are now moving on to the Q&A section of the presentation. And we received a lot of great questions this evening. And we're going to try to get um, through as many as possible. Um, I'm going to start with you, Dr. Taki. Uh, we had one that came in wanting to know what are the effects on the lungs when um, people are vaping using the pen versus smoking marijuana? So there are a few, uh, you know, my specialty is more brain, but I'll try to answer that question. Uh, when people are vaping, there have been studies that have shown that you're inhaling longer. So you inhale more and you expand the lungs more and there's more chances of uh, causing what's caused a uh, 
bullae, like these are uh, structures within the lungs that you can super extend and it can actually cause pneumothorax, which is the rupture of the lung and leaking the air into the chest cavity. Yeah, and it definitely goes a little, because it's cool that it goes a little deeper in the lungs. So I think the damage, like what you're saying, is a little more um, extreme than what you would get from smoking. Both of them are going to cause lung damage. Um, and then David yeah, and personally, Tobar. I believe that because okay. of the flavors, I think it makes it also very addicting and less, more casual. Definitely. Uh, yeah, and we had a parent that brought that up. You know, so many of the flavors are marketed to our, our kids and teens, um, things that they would find um, tasty, such as fruit and candy and gummy bears. So, yeah, they have done a really good job of marketing to um, our students. David Tovar, um, can you tell us how harmful is secondhand marijuana smoke for children and adults? Absolutely, secondhand smoke um, has been shown to be a carcinogen and, and cause cancer here in the state of California and throughout, you know, throughout the world. Uh, and so, you know, cannabis is, is specifically different than, than say tobacco. In fact, cannabis has double, or about double the amount of tar, which is one of the main cancer causing agents uh, w within, you know, when it's smoked. And so, um, well, you know, there's a lot of misnomers and, 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 and misrepresentations of, of the effects of cannabis. Uh, one of them is that it actually emits quite a bit of secondhand smoke, which is um, cancer causing. Okay, thank you for that. Um, Erica, um, we know that addiction's a huge problem and you were really good about talking um, about things that parents can do to help their kids and especially talking with them, um, having conversations, making those conversations consistent. Um, and you gave a great resource through the Marijuana Fact Check, which is really great. We use it all the time here at Breakthrough. Um, is there any other resources that you would recommend or coping strategies that parents should really focus on with their students? Anything specific that just stands out as kind of a prevention um, skill? Um, well, I think just uh, um, adding to everything else that we went over in the presentation, it's just being able to be there with for your kids and just you know I know that life gets hard with work and everything and we're so busy but um starting them at a young age and you know teach giving them those coping skills anything that could be um that can be taught since they're young and like on you know if you're feeling stressed out let me teach you how to fix that let me show you how to do it and that's really important being able to be that role model um and you know showing it at home like when I am upset this is what I do that way they have those resources to knowing like well when my parents were upset they would take mm -hmm. a walk or they would go take a long shower or do some yoga, exercise, um, things like that, because it's really important um, to be able to know how to cope, especially with um, their emotions, because eventually that's what a lot of the youth are telling us why they start using marijuana, maybe because they're stressed or they can't sleep, um, they are depressed, or just it has to do with a lot of the emotional side of it. And if we can teach our children how to cope with the difficulties of life, then they will better be able to make choices when those situations arise. So what you're saying is, you know, not only talking with our kids, but being good role models and that I'm having a hard day. So I'm going to go take the dog for a walk or I'm going to sit down and read a book. So maybe helping their kids identify what are ways that can kind of calm them and help them get in the better place when they're feeling stressed out. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Erica. Um, Senior Deputy Brady, um, question for you. Um, when you are, and you've talked a little bit about what you're seeing um, out in our community for people that might be having uh, heavy marijuana use. Is there a point where you might think that, you know, somebody's using heavy versus maybe has gone to extreme where it's an overdose or an excessive use. Is there anything that differentiates that where you feel like, you know, 
Are they vomiting? Are they sick? Are there things that separate those? Um, I would say in my experience, just the juvenile level would be um, like can't stay awake, um, paranoia, um, explain it, trying to explain to the nurse what's happening, but they can't, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, it does. Heart rate, heart rate's high. Um, they have the, the heavy bloodshot eyes. Yeah. Um, okay. coating on their tongue for, you know, if they just recently smoked, obviously I, I spoke earlier about the, uh, elderly gentleman who was just comatose from edibles, a lot, 80 to 90% of the, uh, excessive THC or marijuana use is, is the edibles and, and those are, are usually end up going to the hostel because they're just so paranoid and, and, and can't even move. They hallucinate too, yeah. some hallucinate. Okay. So those are, those are big signs you see that yeah. you probably need to receive some type of medical care um, outside, like within the hospital or an emergency room to seek right. help. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And then this one I'm just going to throw out to all of our panelists. Um, we could have multiple people chime in, but has marijuana use, and we've seen some of this information that's starting to come out in studies, um, that marijuana use can trigger psychosis in maybe certain individuals. Is there um, any information that we had a parent ask about that and wanted to see if there was any newer information that any of our panelists might be aware of? I think there's no, uh, scientifically we haven't had any proof of marijuana directly causing psychosis, but in my experience, what I've seen that, you know, it depends on where you get the marijuana from and you don't know what the mixers are or what the other elements included. Uh, so a lot of time we have seen marijuana users in the hospital uh, that have very unusual side effects, unusual presentations uh, because of the fact that it's mixed with some other elements. Okay. So thank you, Dr. Taki. So like, um, Senior Deputy Brady and um, was talking about was just that it might be laced with fentanyl or or um, codeine or meth methamphetamine. So just more seeing it in that in that uh, situation. There you go. Correct. Yes. Okay. And then Erica, here is a question for you. We had a parent um, that wanted to know where they can find a drug test to purchase if they wanted to drug test. Um, their, their child? Uh, well, they have them at most of the pharmacies like Walgreens, CVS, Target, Walmart. Um, you could just, you could even go online and Amazon probably has some. Um, they'll have, depending on what they're trying to look for, they'll have, um, and it'll tell you on there what it's testing for, like if it's one that will test for marijuana or cocaine, or you can um, order the ones that will test six different types of drugs or 12 different types of drugs. And, and it'll show you on there how you can use it. Um, so yeah, they could just order some or buy them at the store. Okay. Uh, thank you guys all so much. Um, we, we were able to get through most of the questions. Unfortunately, we were unable to get through all of them, um, but we would like all of our attendees to know that if you would like to access this information again, um, this presentation is being recorded and it will be uploaded on the Conejo USD YouTube channel in the next couple of days. And we will also be emailing out all the attendees the uh, slide presentation. I know there was a lot of information that we had to quickly go through, as well as some of the slides that we weren't able to access. So you will be able to receive a copy of that. Um, I also want our students and families to know that if you need support, uh, we encourage you to reach out to the Caneo Valley Unified School District Student Break Breakthrough Student Assistance Program. Um, the Breakthrough Program is free for all students. K through 12 that need additional support with individual and or family stress. And we will work with you um, in connecting to a counselor um, to get assistance, whether like I said, individual family stress, substance abuse. There's a brief referral form that's on the district website and you'll get connected with a counselor who is going to 
talk with you. They may offer short-term social emotional support, or they're gonna connect you to low cost or free community resources and agencies within our community. Um, and if you're unsure if this is gonna be a good fit or if you have any questions, we just encourage you to please reach out. Your kids are the most important things to us and we wanna make sure that we're providing all the support that, that you and your family need. Um, de habla espanol. Um, as we conclude our presentation tonight, we wanna to say thank you again to our guest speakers who graciously volunteered their time, their experience and their expertise, um, bringing all this information to our students and families. Um, Dr. David Tobar, Dr. Taki, Senior Deputy Rob Brady and School Resource Officer Amber Voorhees, as well as Erica Fernandez. Um, we also wanna thank our students and parents for attending tonight's event presentation um, by the Caneo Schools Foundation and the Breakthrough Student Assistance Program. We look forward to seeing you at future events and wish you guys all a good night. Thank you very much. <laughs>